from the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador. I'm Carla Gonzalez and this is From the South. Millions of voters across South Africa are voting in an election which many say will be a tough test for the ruling African National Congress. Long queues have built up outside polling stations since 6 a.m. local time when voting officially opened. More than 26 million voters are expected to cast their votes at 22,000 polling stations spread across the country. Officials have not said when the final results will be announced. And the leaders of the different political parties contesting the elections joined other voters in the queues to cast their votes. Musi Maimani of the main opposition party, the Democratic Alliance, casted his vote at a polling station in Soweto, on the outskirts of Johannesburg. Speaking shortly after voting, Maimani said he's confident that his party will do well in the elections, as he had done enough to convince South Africans to vote for it. I'm confident about Gauteng, the numbers are turning out, and I'm calling on the people of South Africa. Fear says to us, let's stick with what we know. Hope says, let's bring change. Let's bring a new chapter in this province, in this economic hub, so one day we can deliver jobs. It's the confidence I'm calling for South Africans. Let's not be fearful now. Our country is asking for more of us, and therefore I'm calling upon all of them to turn out to vote today and bring change. The leader of the opposition, economic freedom fighters, Julius Malema, casted his vote in his hometown, Sechego, north of the capital, Pretoria. Malema arrived at the polling station at 10 a.m. local time, transforming into a sea of red as scores of local supporters turn up to accompany him. The economic freedom fighters has grown at a rapid rate since its formation in 2014 after Malema's expulsion from the ruling party. Whatever numbers we'll receive from our people, we'll welcome them with both hands. It's a mandate. Even one vote counts. We'll accept that those are the results, and this is what the people of South Africa feel about uh, the EFF. The president and ANC candidate, Cyril Ramaphosa, casted his vote in the township of Soweto shortly after 11 a.m. local time. Ramaphosa was accompanied by his wife, Sepo Mosepe, and other senior party officials. Speaking to journalists after voting, Ramaphosa appealed to South Africans to vote for the ANC because, according to him, the party was willing to correct what he called past mistakes. So the clear mandate we're going to get out of this election is to speed up the process of growing our economy on an inclusive basis so that we can address the plight and the needs of poor people in our country. The mandate that we are getting here is we must hasten service delivery. And I've been saying that I don't want any further excuses. I just want us to work. Work and implementing our policies and doing what is right by our people is going to be my overriding concern day in and day out. Let's hear from our correspondent, Matuba Malaji, in Johannesburg. He has the latest on this election. After months of intensified campaigns, the polling stations around the country have been open for the 2019 general elections, and we expect to see 26 million registered voters go to the polls and make their mark. 48 political parties are contesting this election. This is the biggest number we've seen in, in any election since the dawn of democracy in South Africa. Now, post-election, that whoever is elected as the president of this country will be facing many challenges during the campaign of to build the build up of this election we've seen many service delivery protests so people have been protesting who, because they are not satisfied with basic services that have been delivered by the different municipalities around the country most of the municipalities of course are under the governance of the african national congress so they are under pressure to win the election and fix these problems but whoever is elected president post these elections faces another 
big issue which is unemployment and most of the people who are unemployment in South African society are the young people and the young people will have said during the campaign when we interview them that they will voice their concerns in the ballot box today to tell the government how they feel about how they've been running the country for the past 25 years and we also know that the Democratic Alliance the official opposition party and the economic freedom fighter the far left firebrand party that's come into politics in 20 only in 2013 have also entered the political space making promises and trying to woo voters away from the African National Congress promising to make effective changes that will give them land and that will give them jobs and that will give them basic services that have, they have not been receiving under the ANC government. So this is a very contentious election that that will actually everybody is waiting to see who will be making more gains because it's one of the most unpredictable elections uh, by far many political analysts saying this the ANC will stay in power but with less votes while other opposition parties will be making gains and taking voters away from the African National Congress but all of that remains to be seen until the counting of ballots later this evening and we know that the service delivery protests that have been going on during the campaigns have also compromised the opening of some of the polling stations but we expect to see the counting of votes later this evening it's back to your studio thank you that was matua matlaji from pretoria and while more than 26 million people are registered to vote local service say six million young people are not registered 55 percent of the voters are women and 45 percent are men a record 48, 48 political parties will contest this year's elections. The party that wins most seats in Parliament will select the President, who will be sworn in on May 25th. And this is expected to be a defining election for South Africa, since it marks 25 years after Nelson Mandela and the African National Congress came into power. Jobs, land ownership, the lack of public services, crime and race are the main concerns of the electorate. So let's take a closer look at the three candidates who have been leading the polls. First, we have Cyril Ramaphosa of the African National Congress. He was a tra key trade union leader during apartheid and the protege of Nelson Mandela, who led talks to end the white minority rule and helped write the new constitution. After a career in business, in 2014, he returned to politics to become Jacob Zuma's vice president. He took over as president of South Africa in 2018. Ramaphosa. Ramaphosa has promised to create 275,000 jobs each year to curb unemployment and to accelerate land reform. We also have Musi Maimane. He's the leader of the Democratic Alliance. He joined the party in 2009 and was fast-tracked through its ranks to take control in 2015. Before getting into politics, Maimane ran his own management co consultancy and lectured at a business school. His main challenge has been to convince many black middle class voters that the DA is not a white party anymore. Maimani says he aims to build one South Africa and eliminate corruption. And last we have the 38 year old Julius Malema. He's a former ANC youth leader who launched the Economic Freedom Fighters Party in 2013. He was kicked out of the ruling party after coming into conflict with the leadership and has thrived as a sort of rebel. Malema is known as the voice of the young and unemployed. He demands the seizure of lands from whites without compensation. He's a strong advocate for nationalization of mines and banks. And earlier we spoke to South African journalist and political analyst Angelo Fick about the growth of the economic freedom fighters and its chance of taking a significant number of votes in these elections. As you pointed out in your introduction of uh, Julius Malema, that he was the charismatic leader of the African National Congress's Youth League, was disciplined for uh, you know all sorts of violations of party code, was kicked out and established his rival party. People assumed in 2014 that he would simply disappear from the political landscape. Uh, the phrase was, it is cold outside the ANC. And so the 6% that the, Af the EFF polled in 2014 surprised many people both inside the ANC as well as across the country. Uh, 
over the last five years, the EFF in Parliament has really been quite vocal in their opposition to the way in which business is being done by the governing party, the African National Congress. And many assume that they will grow their support in this election into the double digit support figure uh, in terms of possibly 10 percent or more. However, we must not forget that the official opposition remains the Democratic Alliance, and they were the fastest growing party up to 2014. And questions remain about whether this electoral performance will continue to grow for them or whether they will in fact shrink, because many people say their appeal is not as strong um, as the appeal of the EFF. But the question I think many people have is how much of the young people who are underrepresented as voters will turn out to vote? Because turnout, I think, will determine whether or not any of these parties gain or lose support. Now, we go to another soundbite that we have from our guest, Angelo Fick. Let's hear that. We have had, you know, really big uh, problems with employment figures. South Africa has a 54% youth unemployment rate. Uh, and, you know, even in the economically good years uh, between 2000 and 2004 under President Thabo Mbeki, it was, it, there was economic growth, but it was jobless growth. And so year on year, unemployment has really increased spectacularly. Uh, there are real crises in education. So while South Africa now educates more people than it did 25 years ago, the quality of post-apartheid education has actually been really, really shoddy. Uh, so even graduates coming out of universities, people who leave school with the school leaving examination, are unable to find jobs in the economy because they're underskilled. We have more stories coming up. Don't go away. Who's moving the chess? What interests motivate the actors behind each event? Se despliega el tablero. And Critical Moves investigates every event from Monday to Friday. Only on the resource. Welcome back. Venezuela's National Constituent Assembly has taken away the immunity of seven lawmakers over the recent attempted coup d'etat. This comes after the Supreme Court of Justice asked the Constituent Assembly to lift the immunity of opposition lawmakers, including Henry Ramos, former president of the National Assembly, Henry Ramos Alup. Now proceedings could be opened against them over crimes such as conspiracy, treason and rebellion. The Constituent Assembly has approved the lifting of parliamentary immunity. If my secretary colleagues bring me the document for the top court of justice, I can sign it right now. Prosecutors in Peru have requested 20 years in prison for former President Ollanta Humala in connection to the Odebrecht corruption case. Umala, who was president from 2011 to 2016, is accused of money laundering to fund his electoral campaign. His wife, Narin Heredia, is also facing a 26-year jail sentence for the same crime. Former presidents Alejandro Toledo, Pedro Pablo Kuczynski, and late Alan Garcia have also been named in the Odebrecht case. Seven people have been killed and 17 were wounded in a prison shooting in Guatemala. The National Civil Police said the dead were prisoners at the rehabilitation model farm. Officials said the shooting stemmed from an altercation. The wounded prisoners were transported to medical facilities. The director of the National Museum in Rio de Janeiro has asked for more financial support from the government of Brazil to save art that was damaged in September's fire. 
Alexander Kellner made the call for funds during a presentation of 27 pieces from an Egyptian collection. The previous government gave around $2 million to preserve the building after the tragedy, but the museum has not received any other public funding since. In April, investigators said the fire started in an air conditioning unit and spread rapidly due to the lack of equipment to fight it. We are having difficulties in the daily running of our institution. Professors don't have places to work. We don't have space to store pieces that we rescue. We can't just leave them on the ground. 100 years after Eva Perón was born, Argentinians remember her political legacy by hosting various events across the country. In the capital, Buenos Aires, women supporting the Peronist movement commemorate the centenary with an artistic performance. The birthday centenary of Peronist spiritual leader Eva Evita Perón did not go unnoticed in Argentina. The Comando Evita group organized an event in the capital in which 100 women of different ages and origins represented Eva in different stages of her life. We want to recognize Eva in the present as much as we do for what she did in the past. What will she look like today? Where will she be? What modern day woman will represent her now? We all feel part of this movement and we believe that Cristina Fernández de Kirchner emulates Eva better than anyone. So we try to create an artistic historical timeline. Eva Perón was the first in line, followed by the Plaza de Mayo Mothers and ending with Cristina Fernández de Kirchner. Various aspects of Eva were represented at the artistic performance. The Evita, who gets involved with labor unions, the Montonera, the actress and the one who loves fashion. I am dressed as the glamorous Eva who loves fashion. I wanted to participate in the performance because who wouldn't want to be the leader of the working class? Especially now where we need to stand for social issues and the working class struggle and look at them from a feminist perspective in order to avoid making the same mistakes. I am dressed as the cover of Eva's book entitled The Reason of My Life. In the book, she talked about her past and wrote about her legacy. Hundreds of women marched from the Obelisco Monument in Buenos Aires to the Minister of Social Development's building. Under the slogans, Peronism is with Cristina and Avoid Macrismo, the latter of which is an Argentine political movement against industrialist president Mauricio Macri. This event serves as a new and unusual way to manifest and recognize Eva as our first great feminist. We also wore green scarves to recognize women's right to have an abortion. She is a unique figure in Argentina history. She is very important to us women, for Peronists, especially in this electoral year. Demonstrators say the event was geared toward regaining some semblance of Evita by offering support and sending love to Cristina Fernández de Kirchner, current leader of the Peronist feminist movement. We wanted to unite to make Evita part of the event so in the coming elections our comrade Cristina can become president again. The event ended with a feminist version of the Peronist march in front of the Social Development Ministry. Artists, feminists, Peronists, and Kirchnerist activists were all present. Cuba is starting its national forum against homophobia and transphobia, although the Conga Against Homophobia event has been cancelled. The National Center for Sex Education, led by Mariela Castro, said the public health minister cancelled the event due to international and regional issues affecting the island. Activists have since criticized the short explanation for the parade suspension. <laughs> Bolivians have celebrated the Tinku Festival, or Encounter, in the Quechua language. Participants fight each other in a celebration that takes place in the Potosi region. The origins of the ritual are unclear, although some reports dated back to pre-Inca times. The fights can carry on throughout the afternoons with only temporary truces. <laughs> The Tinku on May 3rd is a custom from our ancestors, from our great-grandparents. Today, we come into the town to do this sport, that's what I call it. We are all hungry to fight. 
but sometimes the police don't let us fight until the end, and they use tear gas. It's not like in the past. Although Mexico stands among the top 20 oil-producing nations in the world, gas prices remain high. The government says those prices will start coming down within three years, once the country's six refineries are fixed and a new one is built. Mexico is the oil-rich country that is most dependent on gasoline imports. A gallon of gas costs around $4 as gas prices did not stop increasing during the last administration. They were always raising gas prices. From long before, every January, with every new president, we'd have higher gas prices. Years ago, Mexico was self-sufficient in matters of gasoline. President Andrés Manuel López Obrador established a new stance from his very first days in office. I vote that once the new refinery is built and we restore the other six, the price of gasoline will come down. As part of his strategy, every Monday during a news conference, the president name checks service stations that have the highest gas prices. Salieron 125 gasolineras de todo México. Hubo inmovilizaciones en 50 inmovilizaciones de bombas. But why is this happening? The president explains. Pemex sells fuel under our price control. These stations have clear instructions from the Treasury to not increase the price of gas, of diesel, of natural gas and electricity. But there are cases where they abuse their power. In the meantime, the government has started to reduce imports, with reports stating that in March the percentage of foreign fuel dropped by 12%. We're taking one last break. Stay with us. Discover the cultural diversity that defines the continent. The place where art and tradition are part of the same nucleus. Artistic explorations. Valleys. Fridays, only on this world. Welcome back. A bomb blast in Pakistan has killed at least eight people outside a major Sufi Muslim shrine in the city of Lahore. The explosion targeted a police security vehicle. Five of the victims were policemen with many others injured. In 2010, thousands were killed by two suicide bombings at the shrine, considered the oldest in, the, in South Asia. No group has claimed responsibility for this attack that comes as the country marks the holy month of Ramadan. A car bomb attack has been registered at the compound of an international aid group in the Afghan capital of Kabul, injuring at least two dozen people. Security forces exchanged gunfire with the attackers, who targeted the non-profit Counterparty International. Taliban militants claim responsibility for the attack that came on the third day of Ramadan. At least nine injured people were taken to a nearby hospital. More than 150,000 people have been displaced in Syria due to violence in the past week, according to the United Nations. The increase in strikes and shellings in the northwestern region has destroyed 12 hospitals and 10 schools. The UN has since called for an urgent de-escalation of the situation in the region. We have inspected the places where the shelling took place, and we've saved around 10 injured and there was one killed today. 
We have tried as much as possible to remove the rubble and to clear the areas. Of course, the shelling is targeting the rescue teams and the members of the civil defense when they are reaching the location of the shelling. Journalists in Sudan are calling on the transitional government to implement new policies and laws to protect press freedom. A group of journalists say state media is governed by ideologies which do not support the revolution, affecting their ability to be impartial when reporting. They made the comment as they held discussions on censorship and media coverage in Sudan. We had previous censorship of all kinds, including the presence of security officers daily in the headquarters of the newspapers to read the materials and correct them, and to say whether this article is to be published or not. These instructions were issued by different means, either by telephone, verbally, or by messages. Meanwhile, the ruling military council says it agrees with proposals made by protest leaders on the creation of an interim government. They feel Sharia and local norms should guide legislation. Discussions with the opposition are ongoing, but calling early elections within six months would be an option if they cannot reach an agreement. The document we receive has omitted the sources of legislation. Our view is that Islamic Sharia and the local norms and traditions of the Republic of Sudan should be in the sources of legislation. Members of the Homeland Study Group Foundation in Ghana have vowed to declare Volta an independent state if the government fails to release some of its leaders. On Sunday, nine leaders were arrested for trying to declare the Volta region an independent state. They want to form a new country called Western Togoland, compromising of parts of northern Ghana and the Volta region. The leaders are charged with treason and could face the death penalty if found guilty. Iran has withdrawn from key commitments under the 2015 International Nuclear Deal. The announcement was made by President Hassan Rouhani a year after the agreement was abandoned by the United States. The deal sought to curb Iran's nuclear capacities in return for sanctions relief. However, since the U.S. quit, Iran has been hit with renewed sanctions. And we end our news brief, but you can read more on these stories by checking our website, telesurenglish.net. And you can join us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Thank you for watching.